Well, hello, everybody. Um, again, my name is Kim Daly. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to learn a little bit about our Echo Track E20. Um, um, I'm going to start out, and then in a few slides, I'll turn it over to Christian, and he'll um, talk to some technical points for you. So um, let's see. All right, so uh, this is the E20, and more than 40 years of experience went into the development of this system. Um, we really took the time to look at what was best in our existing line of Odom sounders. We asked our customers uh, for feedback, um, added some of our multi-beam technology to push the performance uh, above and beyond what uh, our customers would expect. And of course, we're always open to feedback and, and we really consider all suggestions from our customers. And our goal is to help our customers uh, by providing a quality product that's easy to use, rugged, dependable, all those things that you've come to expect from both the Odom and the Rezon brand. And um, <clears throat> the E20, there are, are three models uh, that you can choose from, right? The traditional single and dual channel. And then we have an extended range for up to six, six kilometers uh, for those people who work in really deep water. All right, so um, outside of the performance, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, how the E20 looks and feels right so we have a new current design that's that's uh, really substantial and we know that the marine environment is is really a harsh environment um, equipment is you know thrown into the back of a pickup truck and carried for miles down the road put in a survey boat and and driven down the river for miles and so it's a really rough um, environment so uh, we built the E20 to withstand, excuse me, we built the, uh, the E20 to withstand that rough terrain and the rough survey environment. <clears throat> um, so you see that blue bumper, that is the EPDM rubber and it protects the unit from small bumps and even drops. Uh, plus, it's a very nice non-slick surface. You can set your laptop on top or it doesn't uh, slide around on the boat deck. And while we don't, you know, encourage anybody to uh, mistreat their survey gear, <laughs> we do know that it does happen. And so, um, you know, the E20 is really rugged and, of course, watertight IP67. Hey, everybody, this is Christian. I wanted to talk some about the technical aspects of the E20 and what it'll provide for the user. So we'll start with the system architecture. Um, as most of you know, um, you know, you, you can either get a single frequency or a dual frequency sounder. So, you know, a typical configuration would be a 200 kilohertz and, you know, 24 kilohertz, we'll say. Um, so that's the wet end. Um, you, you have to choose whether you want a single channel or a dual channel for the E20. Um, and, then of, and of course, top side, you've got your GPS device, your time synchronization, your PPS, and then the E20 goes into the laptop. And this is all done with a, a nice, neat network cable. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Okay. Um, oh, Kim. Okay, there we go. So there's a small delay here in the page up and page down. It seems. Okay. So the main features of the E20, you know, the the job of a single beam echo sounder, and I tell people all the time, you know, that people say, oh, it's a fish finder. No, it's not a fish finder. It's it's you know, it's a survey grade piece of equipment. Its job is to lock onto the bottom 
find a good bottom and stay on it without um, any noise in the water column kind of interfering with its ability to track the bottom. Um, so it, it's one of its main features and its upgraded features is, is the algorithms that it's using in the board itself to do a better job with bottom detection. Um, so there was, there's a lot of improvements um, with the E20 uh, with respect to that. Um, it's got a built-in test environment. It's got the uh, bike control inside of the board, dual channel. You can opt for the extended range. I don't know too many people that need that extended range, but it's got a heck of extended range um, for, your, for your deeper depths. Um, single beam echo sounder user interface. We'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the screens that you'll be looking at real time when you've got this out in the field. And then the, all the standard data output formats. We'll talk more about that, but you know, you've got your DBS message. You know, we're talking about the NEMA messages. You've got DBS, DBT, and then you've got the S7K format that um, most people are gravitating towards now because it's the binary format that comes over an ethernet cable. So it eliminates the need for all these cables being all over your boat. So, and then you've got the automatic operation mode, which is a new mode that they've put in the E20 now where you can, you know, kind of set it and forget it um, may, may be good for some users. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the performance of the E20. And we, we've all seen these, as hydrographic surveyors, seen a lot of these spec sheets. And um, so the one notable thing on this spec sheet here is that with the E20 um, and some of these transducers um, that are spec'd out for 200 kilohertz or 33, you're getting more range with the new sounder. Uh, with respect to your max depth range. Um, the, pre the previous sounders, um, I believe at 200 kilohertz only had a 200 meter range. And with the new E20, you're getting 50 meter additional range. Um, so so that's, that's an improvement um, with this new E20. Okay, and this is just showing that the, you got single channel, and dual channel depth ratings. And then um, then you've got the extended range down there at the 12 kilohertz. You know, If you've got a 12 kilohertz transducer and you're trying to go down that deep, please give me a call. I wanna know what you're doing because uh, it sounds really interesting. Okay, so here's the echogram that we're gonna be looking at real time when we have the E20 in action. Um, you know, it's a little bit different than the eChart or the image software. It's it's uh, rewritten and the buttons are laid out really nicely across the top where you can toggle between the channel one and channel two, increase the brightness. You can annotate the screen, take bitmap images, snapshots of the screen, record video, and then you've got all your settings and operation modes on the left-hand side. So this is what I call the, the, the bottom track, the signal trace, the amplitude signal, and of course your depth over on the right-hand side. So it's really nicely giving you all the information in front of you as you're surveying. All right, and we've all seen these transducers. There is, hundreds of transducers out there. Um, the one top left, that would be more or less your 200 kilohertz transducer, single channel transducer. Um, I call that the hockey puck. And then the one right in the middle, I see that a lot as well, which is the, I call it the football, and it's the dual frequency 224 kilohertz transducer, dual frequency transducer. So the, the E20, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more, but the E20 has the ability to um, have the user choose which transducer you're using. So you can use over 40 different types of transducers with the system, pick it from a list in the E20 software, and then it's, it's kind of tuned to that transducer so you can get the best performance out of it. 
So it's a, that's a nice feature about that, that E20 is, is to be able to couple it with precisely the transducer that you have in the field. And if you've got several transducers for your company, you can interchange them and then the software just choose the transducer you're working for that particular day. Okay, all right, so looking at the back of the panel, we've got our, of course, our LAN connection, our CAT5 coming out the back, and that's what's gonna carry your S7K signal to your PC. Then you're gonna have COM1, 2, and 3. Those are gonna be your serial outputs. Looking at the sync port, it's where you can bring in PPS or the ZDA synchronization. And we've got the transmit one and two, and those are your uh, transducer cables that plug into the top side. And then the power in, 10 to 30 volt DC. Okay, there's your power to the unit. And the nice thing about that, it's variable. Um, you know, you can hook it up to a battery. You can hook it up to a 24 volt battery system. So you've got a little bit of range there. <clears throat> okay. Also on the front panel, you have these blinking lights. These blinking lights will tell you about the activity of the echo sounder. You know, the, the flashing uh, yellow light for the LAN link, it means there's communication between the computer and the E20 itself. Now, um, that flashing LAN light is helpful to ensure that you've got net good network connection between the PC, because if it's not blinking, it's not communicating with the PC. Uh -huh. Troubleshooting, you know, let's look at some IP addresses. So it just really simple with a light telling you if it works or not. And then channel A and channel B, they're gonna flash when the unit is actually pinging. So you'll, you'll know when it's pinging by the lights kind of flashing on and off. Okay. And so it's transmitting a pulse on those channels when it, when it flashes. Okay, so now you have the SBES user interface. When you go into the um, software, okay, it's gonna guide you through the steps um, to get your E20 interface to the PC and get it get it set up for collecting soundings. Um, so here you're gonna choose the echo sounder at the appropriate IP address. Okay. It'll be selected and you'll select it in a dropdown. You've got your transducer channel A and B. Okay. Here's where I was telling you about how you can choose your specific transducer. Like I said, there's a list of over 40 of them there. Then down you have your draft, your sound velocity, your units of measurement. Below that you have your sonar time synchronization, whether you've enabled um, the GPS and the time sync for PPS. Okay. And then you can restart the echo sounder with software down at the bottom left. All right, here's a neat feature about the E20 is you can bring in NEMA position data and motion data. This can be used as a pass through in some software packages. So if you've got all of this equipment plugged into the unit itself, software can now redirect it and send it over the network, okay? Okay, getting ready to start surveying, we've got this GUI where you can set up to survey or, or to do a bar check. And it's all laid out in kind of a, like a wizard fashion, so to speak. The mode down below, if you'll see under just below operation mode, you have set up on deck, and then you have that bar check routine. Right? That bar check routine 
believe that's going to get an update at some point. However, um, it's real important to surveyors to run that routine to verify um, that the sounder is calibrated to depth. So that's in inclusive here inside of this the sounder. Okay, there's three different modes that the sounder can go in, automatic, semi-auto, and manual. Okay, and let's talk about those. Uh, Kim, I think I'm, I, Maybe scroll down past through the. What do you want me to back up? Well, I'm trying to go to the um, to those modes, but I, I guess. Okay. The modes were four, weren't they? Yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah, I'll just I'll just keep continuing. Yeah, I'll just go down. Okay. Okay. Um, with. Just to back up, I just want to reiterate some of the stuff up here with uh, respect to the modes. Okay, um, the modes will allow the user to to go in and take full control of the echo sounder. You can control the pulse width. You can control the gain. Um, all of that stuff is user definable. So if you're in an area where you have some fluff or something, um, you can control how much energy is going down with the pulse or how hard you're listening by controlling the gain. Um, so those three modes, automatic, manual, and semi-automatic, will help you um, kind of find a good bottom track. And um, we can we can talk about those modes at the end if anybody has any questions about those modes. I, I had some slides in there about that, um, and I can I can get that over to you. Um, the annotation for the echo sounder. Um, this annotation can come directly from the user. Um, in the user interface here for the E20 by hitting the marker button, or it can be annotated by your software package and annotated with like a function key with your software. I know for instance, HiPack, you can set annotation uh, back to the echo sounder and it can annotate based off distance and time. So that's, that's, that's helpful. Okay. The, um, the actual image that you get in the software does a great job with seagrass and maybe what some would call an unconsolidated bottom until you get to one. Okay? And what I mean by that is you have seagrass above an unconsolidated uh, bottom. So it's e easily definable here. And like I mentioned earlier, it's the sounder's job to digitize and find the bottom and lock onto it. However, the full signal amplitude is being collected continually. And you'll see that here um, in, in the real-time image for both high and low frequency. Okay, just another example of seagrass sticking up on the bottom. And we can digitize this in post-processing as well if we want to make seagrass inclusive of the data set, the data will be there. Okay. Um, here's some noise in the water column from a, another echo sounder, perhaps. So here again, its job is to lock onto the bottom. So it's ignoring all the noise. So wash under a transducer, you know, some some cavitation, some prop wash, some aeration. You know, it's it's getting down through it. Okay. You know, at the end of the day, we're just looking for a good bottom track and contour mapping and repeatable data. You know, we're, we're all used to producing these maps and, and really want this, this sounder to do a good job for us, and it does. As an example of that is, and I've never really seen a shipwreck surveyed with single beam before to, to this level of uh, visual quality. Uh, this was passed to me and it's of a shipwreck and it's of a long track down the long axis of a ship with a 233 kilohertz. So on the left-hand image, you can see that with that long track that it's got far more detail. 
you know, obviously it's a narrower beam width. You have a smaller footprint on the bottom. So it's showing a higher level of detail than the 33 kilohertz. But the 33 kilohertz really shows that seabed and maybe penetrates down a little bit more to show you resolution on the type of bottom that you may have where it's resting on. So looking at the left-hand image, hitting it with 2200 kilohertz, I can see that around that ship, it looks to be a scouring around on, on the sides of it a little bit. Well, on the 33 kilohertz, maybe that's just a softer uh, bottom perhaps or different type of ping. So it's a different way to interpolate the data by playing the two frequencies against each other. And then of course the 33 kilohertz with being the footprint being so big, um, it doesn't capture um, as much detail as the 200. But I just thought this was a really neat image um, of a single beam shipwreck. Um, so kudos. Okay, this is a little video here that shows in the user interface that you can toggle between channel one and channel two. I kind of sometimes say high and low frequency, you know, that's I'm trying to steer away from saying that's channel one and channel two. And in the Q4 update for the E20, what they're working on doing is being able to display them both at the same time. So you don't have to toggle them. You can see the difference in the channel one and channel two swap as this video plays along. You can really see that low, you know, that lower frequency transducer penetrating that bottom, uh, getting getting more signal down through it. Okay. Okay, so Kim, I'll uh, pass it over to you. Yeah, so um, so this is this slide's just kind of giving you an idea of how the E20 is packaged. Um, all fits inside a nice uh, Pelican type case. And I uh, also wanted to let everybody know that uh, Beginning in January, the E20 is going to replace our existing CB line of echo sounders. So we've really had um, great response from customers on the E20, and so the sales have far surpassed that of, of our legacy sounders. So, um, so we're going to make that transition over to just the E20. Um, the Mark III will still be available, but the CBM, CB100, CB200 line um, will not be available after uh, the end of December. And of course, we'll still support those systems um, for a number of years or until we can't uh, source components. Um, so no worries there for the time being. Um, and we also plan another software update uh, here in Q4 with some exciting things. And I think another slide has, has some of those things uh, listed out. So uh, we've worked with uh, all the big software companies um, on uh, building drivers for the E20. And so all of these on the screen here, IVA, Beamworks, QPS, um, our own Teledyne PDS, Chesapeake and HiPAC. Um, we're all compatible now. And so that, that's a great thing for all of our existing customers for sure. Um, and, and this is one of the cool things about the E22 is that it is easily integrated into, um, you know, everybody loves the remote control autonomous vehicles now, that's the big thing. And so, um, these are the ones, uh, the manufacturers that we've worked with closely here recently, and uh, the E20 has been installed in all of these vessels. Um, and, it, and it makes it a really uh, versatile piece of kit, right? Because you can put it on your big survey vessel and then you can take it off of there and put it on one of the autonomous vessels if you need to. 
So it's a pretty good all around hydrographic survey tool at a really affordable price as well. Um, so this, I just got this list a couple of days ago, and this is what um, will be included, uh, these things at least in the Q4 update. So um, you're going to have greater access to the range, uh, gain, power, access, uh, et cetera, settings in the sounder where those were restricted in some regards before. Um, you'll have blanking. That's a big one that a lot of people have asked for. Um, now annotations available on the bar check mode, and I believe you'll be able to save, um, you know, those settings in the bar check mode. Um, well, that's the next one, right? Save, restore configuration option. Um, you'll be able to see both dual in the single frequency in one window. Um, and a lot of people over in um, APAC and Latin America um, still use the printer, and that's why they the Hydrotrack 2 was so popular. So we're going to um, we come up with a printer solution. It's going to use a commercial off-the-shelf printer, but there'll be an interface, so that'll be easily um, easily used now and solve that problem. Um, manual gates and automatic detection and configuration of serial sensor interface. So all of those will be included in this Q4 update. And, and uh, I always like to include this slide because uh, it's really important. Uh, Teledyne as a whole, our value proposition, um, you know, we want to assure people, our customers, that they're working with the, the right team. Um, you know, we have a lot of engineering and a lot of support that stands behind our products, not just the Odom brand, but all the Teledyne Marine brands. So. Um, you know, I think that the partnership between our customers and Teledyne is, is a real value to our customers. And here's some contact information from all uh, for all uh, Christian and myself. And then I included David Andrews on here, and he's also uh, online this afternoon or this morning. So if anybody has any questions that either myself or Christian can't answer, David is here to help. Uh, he is a wonderful source of support for all of the Odom customers. He's been with Odom for a long time, I'm sure. Probably 90% of the people online uh, know David and have spoken with him over the years. So um, he's a great asset for us. David, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Hi, Kim. Thank you so much for presenting. Uh, it doesn't look like David is on yet, but um, there has been, has come in quite some good questions. Do you want to give it a go? Sure. Yeah. So the first question that we got in is, um, is the software included when I buy the E20? or can I still use it with the old Atlas or Odom software? So it doesn't work with eChart. You'll get a new single beam user interface. It's, you know, that new software that comes with the Echo Track E20. Um, but we don't, you know, HiPack is not included or PDS is not included. All those are a la carte. So um, you would choose your acquisition and processing package separately. I think, did, did that answer the question? I hope, otherwise, uh, yeah. <laughs> the question will come back. <laughs> um, there's another question here that says, uh, is there a rec recommended power supply, 12 or 24? Um, go ahead, Christian. Okay, so the, the only thing that I would say about that is just, kind of being a field person that these electronics for boats have a have a range for voltage for a reason. So, um, you know, boats, you know, your recreational boats will have a 12 volt source available, which this unit's perfectly capable of, of, of powering the unit with. 
And then you've got some other commercial boats that usually run 24 volt systems. And it's capable of running off that as well. So it covers the range of you know, your recreational boat all the way to your commercial type power situations where these battery banks or these power supplies kind of vary. And then I'm um, not sure up to 30 volts um, what that's about, but maybe that's just a buffer. But um, in my opinion, it's just, it's just kind of what vessel you're on uh, determines what kind of power. If it was me and I just wanted to go out and collect some single beam data over the side mounted, I might just get a car battery and hook it up 12 volts. It should work just fine. Thank you for that, Christian. And um, move on to the next question. Um, do you need a null modem cable for the DPS for the E20 to work? I don't believe so. I do not believe so. I think you can hook it in just regular RS-232 with your three pins transmit, um, your transmit, receive, and signal ground regular. I, I will verify that, but I do not think that that's the case. Okay, thank you. So we'll come back with a with an answer to that. Um, next question is, what was the trace of the bottom of the UI displaying? I wonder what slide that was. Hmm. Can't see what time the question came in. Christian, could it be this down here? Could be, and that's just the, the signal amplitude over time. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so if, if you if you look at that bottom window from from what I can so what I see here is I see that signal down at the bottom, which is that red signal that can be matched up with the bottom trace in the bigger window above that shows the bottom track. So it's kind of the signal amplitude over time as the window scrolls. So you've got the vertical signal amplitude on the right hand side. So if you look at this slide and you look at the depth of 9.62, um, just to the left of that in that vertical wedge is the signal amplitude. So you've got the bottom track to the left of that in the normal window and then below that you have additional signal amplitude over time tracing across the bottom as well. All right. Uh, Kim, do you, do you have that slide of that bond? Of the what? of that pond, of that pulp pond, um, where I show the high and low frequency together? Yes, what happened to that slide? Okay. Anyway, maybe, maybe we, we can send that out because in interest of time, we are running a bit late. I've got two more questions and then we will close down and, and we can answer what, if there are any questions we didn't get. Um, we will send that out later. So the next question is that bar check routine update can't come soon enough. <laughs> we need a report similar to the CV100. Uh, we've had ours since May and we need that in our deliverables. Mm -hmm. I guess that was more common than. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it should be soon. Yeah. Will the gates apply to the bar checking window? Yes, they should. Okay. Keep my Christian. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, as you said, Kim, you had your contact details at the end of the presentation here. Um, and we will answer any questions that we didn't answer now. Do you have any more comments? No, just thank everybody for um, for calling in. I appreciate it, and um, 
please reach out if you have any other questions that uh, if I can't answer, I'm happy to get David to, to chime in and I'm sure he'll have the answers. And Christian, thank you so much for, um, for joining in as well. You were a, a huge help. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day and keep pinging away. <laughs> awesome. <laughs>